Hello, uh, welcome to the ACOM seminar, the first of two this week. We're having one on Thursday at 3.30 also. Um, uh, today we're pleased to have with us Ulrika Niemeyer who's been visiting ACOM since August and is here until early January. Um, Ulrika is visiting from uh, the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Hamburg. She got her PhD uh, from the University of Hamburg in 1997, and since then she's worked in Hong Kong and Paris, um, as well as in Hamburg, uh, where she's been active in uh, research on stratospheric aerosol and stratospheric ozone, and in particular on um, supervolcanoes and climate engineering projects. She's, she's contributed to a number of climate engineering projects such as the Geoengineering Model Intercomparison Project, uh, or GEOMIP, um, impact, IMPLIC, which is the impact of climate engineering on climate atmospheric dynamics and precipitation, um, and the uh, other studies on impact of stratospheric sulfate on ozone, chemical processes, and atmospheric dynamics. Um, and she's participating in the special priority program of the German Science Foundation on, on climate engineering. She's here today to talk about climate engineering and sulfur injections, uncertainties, and limits. Ulrika. Thank you, Mike, for this introduction. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here and to stay at NCA for this very nice four months. Uh, yeah, I would like to talk a bit briefly about geoengineering today. And first of all, I, I hope my voice will do it. First cold since years at the moment. Uh, so uh, G CO2 emissions into the atmosphere are constantly rising since many, many years at the moment. So we're starting in the inter time of industrial revolution around 1815 with the, where the steam engines urgently were needing energy. We started burning coal and since then this coal in, is increasing the use of coal all started after the around here after the first world war and after the second world war really the inner energy demand of the uh, world is strongly increasing and the CO2 uh, emissions per year since then are really constantly increasing without uh, really stopping up to now. Here we have uh, the same but per capita. So we can see that uh, after the second world war the emissions of uh, CO2 were really strongly increasing, also per capita, the demand was very high for energy. Then around the first oil crisis, it stopped. Per, I guess also population was <coughs> more increasing during that time, so we somehow came to a level that uh, we do not increase energy demand per person anymore, but with the strongly increase of the economy in the mostly Asian economies or since the year 2000, this is increasing again. <clears throat> and we all know that, yes, climate change is uh, some of the, one of the consequences. And in order to see the, our future, some climate project projections were developed, which uh, we all use for uh, simulation with our climate models. So here we have the, so the radiative forcing against, the te uh, against time, the historical part here with the impact of the volcanoes very nicely visiting, uh, visible. And we see here the most negative scenario, RCP 8.5, with strongly increasing uh, emissions, which we currently still are following. Two more medium scenarios, RCP 4.5, I will talk about later as well. And we have one scenario where the radiative forcing after an increase around three, uh, maximum around three watt per square meter here is constantly decreasing. This is the only one which has decreasing in emissions or decreasing CO2 concentrations within this scenario. And it also includes uh, negative emissions. It's the only scenario that will be able to uh, 
reach a two degrees goal or the even 1.5 degrees goal, what's at the moment hot topic after the uh, COP21 meeting last year. <clears throat> In order to stick to this two degrees goal, uh, we have only roughly 1,000 gigatons carbon we can uh, emit until we reach this goal. If we do it constantly with increasing emissions at the moment, we have roughly 30 years for this. And thereafter, a really extremely strong decarbonization must, will be necessary to keep us to the two degrees. As I mentioned before, RCP 2.6, is the only one that will really reach this goal with negative emissions. What, what does this mean? Here we see on the left the primary energy use. This is what is behind this RCP 2.5 scenario. And here in a, for a publication from Gaza et al, we see uh, the CO2 emissions, which are even the primary juice is increasing they are decreasing. So when we look a little bit more into the emissions here, we see uh, coal and oil is increasing until the year roughly 2020 here. In the normal use, we do it currently around the year 2020, but here new colors are popping up. Not, not only renewables, which would be the light uh, yellow here, but here we have also still coal and oil but we find here at the end the short CCS, carbon capture and storage. So within these scenarios, it's very strongly and starting very, very soon, they assume that we are be able to do carbon capture and storage, which means that uh, we either capture the CO2 directly at the stack or we uh, try to remove it from the atmosphere like uh, artificial trees that work Klaus Nackner, not so far from, or still far, but uh, in Phoenix is working very strongly on. Or we try enhancement like weathering. So weathering will also take CO2 out of the atmosphere, use bioengineering. However, CCS is really a very strong part. And at the moment, it's not really available right? because none of these techniques is finally working, especially it's not working in this case, we would need it. <clears throat> Behind this scenario here, you can see here many lines. So there behind are different scenarios. They uh, try to calculate what's in our option in order to still reach this goal of uh, RCP 2.6. And one of their uh, more pessimistic scenarios where they mitigate, so where they try to decrease the emissions by a changing energy mix or more renewables, they say, okay, we do remission, uh, mitigation by 1% per year, which is much more, com or a lot compared to the still increasing emission we have at the moment. In order we would do is it would be necessary to do CCS in a, in range between 1,000 and 1,600 gigatons carbon. Or if we put it into CO2 for the next uh, transparency, it would be 5,500 gigatons of carbon. In case we are better and reach the goal of 5% per year, then these numbers are a lot smaller. So at all, we're looking into our possibilities of the storage capacity for CCS. Here on the left, <clears throat> we have the supply, which is available or partly used, and the contribution to the temperature on Earth. And here it's the amount of CO2 in gigatons. And here we have the storage capacity. So they say, and they assume, that when you have gas, where you got, take gas out, it's a very safe storage option because the gas which was in before was not leaking and you can put it in again. So CO2 is a gas, which would give us about the capacity of 500, roughly 500 gigatons CO2. For oil, it's quite similar. Besides, the CO2 as a gas would have another density. So there's another <clears throat> 500 together. These two really safe storage capacities and following their assumption, they are the only really safe 
storage capacity for, for carbon we have, we will end up with roughly 1,000 gigatons. For even this more optimistic or the less optimistic mitigation scenarios we had before, with 1% reduction um, per year, it would be necessary that we store 5,500. And they assume that we start in three or four years. So this seems to be not really easy. Geologists we I just have talked to say, yes, of course, there are many other options. Yes, there are many, many other options. None of them at the moment is at the point that we know how safe they are. I just got the answer. 10% heating is no problem. I'm not sure that everybody here would agree on that, especially as it takes a lot of energy to get the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, so why would we have a 10% except a 10% leaking? Or like saline aquifers, we have they, uh, the CO2 will be in contact with water there. And it's not sure if this would be safe and what, how the CO2 really would uh, behave. So it's it's very difficult to say that we can base uh, our current activity on near future carbon uh, capture and storage options. So at this point, we come to climate engineering, as we are still thinking about getting to the, our two, de two degrees target. So could we cure the climate this way, where climate engineering, geoengineering, climate intervention, however we would like to name it, however it the deliberate large-scale manipulation of the planetary climate and environment. <clears throat> there are many ideas at the moment. I've been talking about this part here, capture and storage, which is part of carbon dioxide removal techniques, which are also afforestation, logging the trees, uh, creating biochar, and then putting it into the earth or iron fertilization, alkalization. So this might be an option which has a bit of potential. So these are all these carbon dioxide removal techniques. I'm more focusing from, for my work on the radiation management techniques, where we may put gigantic spir uh, mirrors into space at the Lagrangian point, cloud seeding, so where maybe this way looking nice floats, which are just pumped uh, sea salt into the marine atmosphere at low levels to brighten the clouds, so to get more tiny little particles, which make the clouds look whiter. Or we inject SO2 or maybe also other uh, aerosols into the stratosphere, and they reflect sunlight. Within our EU project, Mike also already mentioned IMPLIC, together with the uh, then upcoming model intercomparison project, we thought also what might be the climate impact of this. So I would like to show you the results of three simulations we did. So one was G1, where we balance four times CO2. At the same time, we reduce the solar constant. So we try to balance the forcing of the four times CO2 to a constant uh, control forcing. Similar idea behind G2, but we only increased the CO2 by 1% per year. And G3 is a little bit more practically approach. We use the RCP 4.5 scenario and inject uh, SO2 into the stratosphere in order to keep the a constant climate of the year 2020. So here we see the G1 again. Our control one, we say four times CO2 at the same time, we reduce the solar constant so that our net forcing stays constant. Here we have results from IMPLEC, or written up by Hauke Schmidt. These are our te surface temperature mean values of four different models. On the left is the comparison, a comparison four times CO2 minus, minus PI control. We see a really strong increase of temperature as to be expected. When we do the geoengineering here, G1 minus PI control, we see that we get still warming within the polar region, but we get a cooling in the tropics as we do solar 
Uh, geoengineering, it's only working if we have enough sunlight and we don't have sunlight in the winter at the poles. But the CO2 with four times CO2 is there, it's warming the poles. So we have still higher temperature in the northern and the southern regions here around the poles. And we have to compensate this by a stronger temperature decrease over the poles. Of course, this has consequences. We, we change the uh, temperature gradient between the tropics and the pole with <coughs> impacts to the atmospheric dynamics, especially to the ITC set. Here, the precipitation again here, comparison to four times CO2 and the G1 results, we see under climate change strong increases in precipitation in many, many areas, but also some areas with decreasing. When we look into the precipitation pattern of G1, it's an overall more or less a, G, a decrease of the precipitation in wide areas over Europe, over, the, uh, over North and South America. So we can see that uh, we have globally a decrease in the precipitation of three to seven percent. When we compare four times CO2 to G1, we have even a decrease of 8 to 15 percent in the global value. And so it's a question, a matter of what is our perspective, which values of more increase, interest for us. When we look into aridity, an argument many people say when you just look into peer control, because we decrease evaporation, you cause less sunlight at the surface. Aridity is slightly less impact, but still we see also a de decrease in aridity. So more aridity, let's say it better this way. Here I would like to mention the termination. Mostly this is a G2 experiment where we increase 1% of CO2 per year. We see the temperature increase over 50 years here. The geoengineered results are this one. They stay around zero. So we manage to keep the climate on a much cooler level quite well. Besides all the different models give slightly different ranges here. So like this model is not doing such a good job. This is maybe a bit overcompensation. However, we are all switching off the geoengineering after 50 years. And we can see that the model really nicely agree on this extremely strong jump in temperature in roughly five to 10 years or less than five. So, so here after 10 years, we are almost back to normal level after 20 Yes, only one model is uh, not reaching the, this temperature. But of course, life in this, under these conditions must be extremely difficult. <coughs> so in G3, these are now uh, simulations just uh, done with our uh, system model. It's Mark Planck, our system model. We prescribe sulfate injection there, which we calculate with our, our aerosol models before. And uh, we compared different uh, geoengineering techniques. So we reduce the solar constant. We inject sulfur into the stratosphere. We also simulated sea salt emissions over the tropical oceans. And in order to do the simulation, I uh, did a somehow control simulation, which is named FIX, where we keep the 2020 greenhouse gas uh, conditions constant. And with all these, we try to uh, do balance RCP 4.5 forcing towards the constant 2020 climate. And we can see here for the temperature that the temperature is for all simulations slightly increasing compared to the RCP 4.5, which is strongly increasing because of the reaction of the ocean. So we still have a on slightly ongoing climate change. We see here the surface fluxes that <clears throat> When we do no geoengineering, we just keep the greenhouse gases constant and fixed. Then they, the results are very similar to um, RCP 4.5. But we reduce with the geoengineering the incoming solar radiation at the surface. For when we do sol, uh, sol so we use a, the mirror idea. We just play around with the solar constant. And for the other two, aerosol-based uh, experiments, uh, sulfate and sea salt emissions, we see that we even have a stronger reduction of the incoming uh, shortwave radiation at the surface, mostly because we have to, they are, both of them have a slight uh, 
warming, as they have also a greenhouse impact, and we have to overcompensate this. <clears throat> and this has consequences for the precipitation. So the global uh, precipitation we get, are, is much, the reduction is much stronger for the aerosol-based cases than it is for the solar-based simulation. So the numbers I've shown before would be even stronger if we just do uh, it with sulfates aerosols. And it's also as uh, regional impacts. So here, uh, the zonal means for the precipitation as a global, so ocean plus land and the land values only. We see the strongest impact here are related to changes in the ITCC. But we see that one experiment in both cases is really behaving different than the other one. So that's a sea salt experiment. So when we inject sea salt, by purpose, we try to reduce the precipitation over the ocean as we try to get more smaller aerosol particles or smaller droplets in the clouds, and they precipitate less. We have, so in the tropical area here, a clear reduction of the precipitation. But over land, when we plot land only, we see that this is a, uh, an experiment where the precipitation is increasing. Always the first big question was what is going on, but looking into the uh, <clears throat> more into the dynamics, one can see that land to sea gradient is increasing under this experiment, and it has clear impacts on the water circulation, and the monsoon is changing. So it has really a diff impact for this experiment or this geoengineering technique is quite different to uh, the other ones. When we plot precipitation minus evaporation to come a bit closer to what we really need, like aridity or soil humidity, we see that uh, all of them have impact, but it's less than what we can see if we only look into the precipitation alone. So, but still also here we see the decrease in the P minus E values for almost all experiments. <laughs> So overall, we can say that this engineering climate would not be the same as a natural one. Even we try to keep the frosting condition to 2020, it's another climate. The temperature gradient between the tropics and the poles is reduced. We have, uh, therefore, impacts on the atmospheric circulation, impacts on the monsoon, and we change the hydrological cycle. And when we terminate, it takes roughly only 10 years uh, to increase the temperature by one degree. So a little bit more about uh, sulfate injection into the stratosphere. This is following, like uh, you can see here, the idea behind following the uh, volcanic natural analogy. We inject SO2 as a volcano would do into the stratosphere, it has to be high up into the stratosphere in order to wipe uh, rain out as it's really nicely soluble in water. It's reacting with OH and forming S2SO2, which is then form a, uh, formed into aerosols. These aerosols reflect and scatter shortwave radiation. So we get less shortwave radiation at the surface, which is what we want, the cooling. But at the same time, uh, the sulfate is absorbing in the near infrared and in the long wave. And this is warming. So we can assume that we have all this layer here is warmer than the surrounding uh, atmosphere. We are interested in the um, evolution of the sulfate. So we use uh, the model ECAMHAM, which includes, so it's a GCM, which includes our aerosol microfossil model. The model has, uh, it's a mode model with uh, sen uh, seven log normal modes. So we have nucleation, icon, accumulation, and cross mode in the model. So we can uh, calculate nucleation, condensation, coagulation, and accumulation. And we also have a sedimentation, and dry and wet deposition as, uh, as sink terms. And our um, sulfate, as we talked before, is coupled to radiation. So it is, of course, reacting by long, on the long wave and short wave radiation, which is really important to see the dynamical impacts. With this model, we prepared the SO2 that we used for the results of G3 I have shown you before. 
And this curve show, shows you the amount of injection that was necessary in order to keep the 2020 climate condition under the RCP 4.5 forcing. So we have here an increase, constantly increase over time, and at the end of our simulation was necessary to inject roughly six megatons uh, sulfur into the stratosphere, which is about the amount of three, four, uh, three quarter of a Pinatubo eruption per year. Pinatubo in 91 was the largest eruption we had in the last century. So year after year, it's necessary to inject three quarter of a Pinatubo again. At the same time, we were asking if the forcing of RCP 4.5 is not that strong, would it be possible to do a simulation with a larger forcing to use RCP 8.5? And chief, the amount we, uh, that would be necessary, we saw here very easily. Uh, so, so what I calculated at that time would only be enough to do it for the year until the year 2050, and we know that the particles are growing when we increase the injection. So we were really raising the question, would it be possible? Or would the particles get so large that we cannot inject or cannot get the forcing we need to counteract RCP 2.8, RCP 8.5? So the question is really, would it be not only this small amount, what we did before, could we really do this? And I used our model again and injected much higher values, up to 100 teragram sulfur per year. And this figure shows already as uh, RCP 8.5 down to a 2020 limit was, would be 5.5 watt per square meter. So we can see here, yes, our model tells us it would be possible. But we can see also that this is by far not a linear curve. It clearly follows an E function. And the efficiency of the injection are strongly decreasing. So when we inject 40, uh, 80, 50 megatons, we roughly come to forcing of six watt per square meter. When we double this to 100, we only gain two watt per square meter more. So the efficiency is clearly decreasing, but it would work for our model. And if we take this E function and calculate the limit of at this, we come to minus 67 watt per square meter, which is yeah, quite high, but uh, maybe not a nice world to live in to, to counterbalance this strong amount. And it would be really yeah, a very strong forcing as extremely high emissions necessary. However, the, this decrease in the efficiency we just plotted here again. Here we have the, the forcing, the watt per square meter divided by the amount of uh, teragram we injected, plotted against the injection strength. So we can see for our curve, which is this one here again, that the higher our injection is, the stronger is the decrease in the efficiency, the less forcing we gain per injected megaton. And I also plotted the long wave and the short wave impact. And we see that for the long wave, the, long, the absorption of the long wave radiation is warming by 0.1 watt per square meter per injected megaton. But however, this is constant, and it's the ratio the difference between these two curves, and responsible for the clear decrease in the efficiency is only the short wave part at the scattering of the aerosols is decreasing with a higher injection rate. We get larger particles, and the particles the larger particles scatter far less than smaller particles do. So the decrease scattering is the main reason for the strong decrease in efficiency. We also were asking if there are other uncertainties as we use one model and we use one setup of our uh, simulations. Our setup was that we injected into one grid box at the equator at the height of roughly 20 kilometers. And we compared def different strategies of our um, injection uh, for the 10 teragram case. And we found that when we just increase the height of the injection, we uh, gain 50% because we just have a thicker layer, longer uh, sedimentation path. So we have a uh, yeah, higher AOD we get. Uh, slightly also we get a slight impact in, on the dynamic because we are higher and uh, the mirror transport of our aerosols is slightly different. When you change the area of the injection, so we increase it, 
like we just not only inject into one box. If we inject along the equator, we decrease our efficiency due to reason of aerosol microphysics. And the same is when we not only inject at the equator, or we eject between 30 north and 30 south, we also decrease the efficiency. And we also compare to other studies which show roughly plus minus 20% different values. Here, a little more detail on this results. It's now the aerosol optical depth. For um, the gen 10 meter uh, ton injection case, here the orange is our basic case where I just have shown the curve before. When we decrease or when we increase, inject along the, all the along equator, we get a, overall everywhere a lower AOD. So we decrease the efficiency because we get larger particles again. Here you can see the impact when we inject between 30 north and 30 south. As we inject over a wider area in the tropics, we have a slower, uh, lower uh, values here within the tropics, but we also are outside of the tropical transport barriers. So with, directly within the tropics, close to the tropical jets, wind stream, wind jets, we stick the aerosol there. The reason for this clear peak on the high maximum we have here, when we inject partly outside of this transport barriers, uh, we have then there a good transport toward the, mirror, uh, toward the extra tropics, but we have much lower values in the tropics. When we increase the height, as mentioned before, we have a longer sedimentation part and higher AOD. We have seen also when we, for some study, increased the amount of vertical level. So the previous results were uh, done with the model versions with 39 levels, and then we increased our model level to 90, and we are now, with 90 levels, be able to simulate the quasi biennial oscillation. So the, the oscillation of the sonal winds at the equator, where they roughly every second or so 29 months, I think, is this, where they change from easterly to westerly wind. When we inject SO2 into the stratosphere, we heat the stratosphere there, and this is disturbing this oscillation. When we inject roughly four megatons, we get a slowing down of this oscillation. So here we have here for five years in this case. And when we increase our injection to eight megatons, we even completely break down this oscillation. We get a constant westerly phase in the lower stratosphere and a constantly easter phase, Lee phase in their uh, higher stratosphere. The reason for this is really the warm, mostly the warming. The heating of the aerosols disturbs the thermal wind balance, which increases the westerly wind. But we also increase the vertical upwind, the omega star, and this is um, disturbing the downward propagation of the QBO. And so published is similar, very similar results by Valentina Aquila. She, they found it very parallel to us, but they published what we have not done so far. However, this QBO simulations show that we also have a transport impact of this QBO. Here in orange, again, our previous results of the AOD. Here we see now when we use the, have this uh, strongly disturbed cube in the simulations that we get a very strong peak here. As we increase the wind speed of these tropical jets, we increase the transport barrier. And we really transport far less sulfate meridianally towards the tropics, so the consequence are also the lower uh, AOD outside of the tropics. And for the top of atmosphere imbalance, as the, the curve here we have seen before with very high levels now only until 10 megatons, we see that we really decrease the efficiency clearly when simulating this QBO and when disturbing this uh, QBO <coughs> cycle, especially as under westerly wind conditions, which we have here now, we really have uh, even a stronger transport barrier. When we play this game a little bit further, and we did compare here now two eight megaton uh, simulations. This one injecting at 20 k 
kilometers, so 60 hectopascal, there's a 30 hectopascal higher levels, where I said before that we have a clear increase of our efficiency. We see that we much strongly, more stronger disturb the QBO. We get really a higher wind speed and also a vertical increase of this westerly jet. Stronger westerly jet has, again, transport consequences. And here the red curve shows out that under this higher injection case, now we really have all, almost all aerosols only within the tropics. And the AOD outside of the tropics is really low. And this is also um, then well seen here for the TOA imbalance, especially for the, then for the high injection case. Here the wind speed gets so high that even our that we even, so compared to this 39 level simulations, we decrease the efficiency even still slightly higher than uh, this 30 level here. But it's really a clear impact on, on the transport and what is also my interest for the next future is to see the impact on the climate as uh, we of course have completely different conditions. If we have a prepare, have a AOD like this where we almost have to geoengineering only in the tropics compared to a, uh, to a AOD like this, where we have uh, a strong AOD everywhere, so and also have impacts of the, for cooling outside of the tropics. Of course, there are many uncertainties. We have no proof in reality of these results. The volcanic impacts are too short to really clearly show us this in reality if this is just a model artifact or if it's true. It's not really clear, clear which uh, role ozone will play and also the role of the SST on the QBO and also the climate state. Currently, together with Simone and uh, Jager, we are trying to compare the action, reaction of our models and we have simulations both of F in the machine to see if we get similar results or if the models are really reacting very differently. <clears throat> so again, this uncertainties, I must say here with the QBO overall, we get a decrease of our limits or TOR forcing calculations we had before by 15% or even for the injection, higher injection area, not a plus of 50, it might be possible that we decrease to 10%. What would this mean if we really would say, yes, we want to do balanced occupancy 8.5 to the climate of the year 2020? Would mean that we inject 45 terabytes sulfur per year, which is five to seven minute turbo eruptions per year, adds 85% to the anthropogenic SO2 emissions of the year 2010. I show this. We decrease polar ozone by 10 to 20%. We also decrease tropical ozone. And global precipitation would decrease by roughly 6.5%, which is more than the increase we gain in under 8.5 conditions compared to PI control. So it's quite a bit, and locally, of course, a lot more. And coming back to the general questions of geoengineering, would it work or not? When we look at these projections or these results of the climate projection for the temperature, we would say, OK, we inject continuously. What should we do? Would you want to start our climate engineering here and then go on for all these 500 years? Would it be an option? We may come back to this scenario here, the LCP 2.6, which is uh, <clears throat> the only one sticking to the two degrees. And these are now uh, results from Simona. She had this idea. She took this RCP 2.6 scenario, but that, OK, will be impossible that we start with carbon capture and decreasing the emissions in the year 2020. Let's allow us to increase the CO2 emissions over the next 30 years until maybe the year 2050. And this is the point where we then reach the two degrees. And in order to stick to this two degrees goal, we do geoengineering by the injection of SO2. So they injected 
starting in the year 2040, slowly increasing or even strongly increasing SO2 here until a maximum value around the year 2080 of 18 teragram SO2, so roughly nine teragram sulfur per year. And the geoengineering to keep to the 2020 after they started here, the carbon capture and the decreasing of the emission would ongoing until the year 2170, so for more than 100 years, which already are three, four generations, however, we would like to count it. So, so it would be a long time burden on all the following uh, generations. So we can see, yes, this is uh, the strong injection case here, it would keep us under the two degrees. It would again decrease the precipitation, not so strongly the ar aridity, but yes, it buys, buys us a bit of time. We may hope that CDR would work until then or not. We may find other options to store it because we inject more CO2. We would need more CDR in order to get rid of all this again. And if we look more in the practical points, there is a study of just what came, in, came out from Moriyama et al. And they calculated following the Pierce et al. Uh, H2SO4 injection, that it would be necessary to counterbalance two watts per square meter. You need 1,300 airplanes and fly, fly 6,500 times per day. <clears throat> It costs you with a currently existing aircraft roughly 90 billion per year. It might be less if you deal well n new airplanes. They have maybe less operational costs. I'm not really sure if the development costs would be there in because we also are talking about the stratosphere. Not all planes can fly there, especially not for our high injection cases. We reach a level in the stratosphere where planes still, at the moment, at least existing planes cannot go. And when we come back to Simone's study, uh, for her injections to stick to two watt per square meter, it was necessary to inject three times more sulfate than their exemption. So all this by three. Compare this to the, one of the largest airports we have, Heathrow, where they have 1,300. It would be necessary to have 15 times the Heathrow airport, which okay, might be the smallest problem of all we relate to this. <clears throat> As a summary, here to reach this two degrees uh, goal, it would be necessary de to decarbonize our economies within, in the next 30 years. The storage capacity of CO2, the, the real safe storage capacity is limited. There might be other options which are not really developed at the moment. And the RCP 2.6 scenario, 6 and 0 include the CCS, which is currently not available. Even many of us as climate modelers are not really aware of that. For the solar radiation management, I showed that uh, the climate will differ from a natural one, that uh, the hydrological cycle changes, and the for the solar injections, they really, or their efficiency decrease with increasing injection, so it's necessary to even inject more SO2 to, to get the forcing we want. We have impacts on the QBO, and of course, climate is not the only part of climate engineering. As to ask with Alan Robock, who is hand on the thermostat? Which climate do we want? who is responsible to create the climate and well, do we want a climate that's fine for here or maybe fine for Canada or Alaska, for Russia, they want to have a warmer, I guess, especially warmer as Indonesia where it's maybe already too warm. So who is going to decide this? What is our reference point? We want to stick to the year 2020 as we did in our simulations or to peer and control values or to the climate of the year 2050, who is going to decide it? It will be necessary for many, many centuries and we put a big burden to the next generations. And international law is also a big problem. Regulations are necessary. Question is how could we avoid that maybe a single country is doing CE? 
And it's also important to, to uh, have a liability system. So I'm working currently with a group of economists and lawyers together. And we used our model results to find regions which may have problems under climate engineering. And they said, OK, Poland will get drier, and they face it rot. And they will try to go to Kurt. And in their idea, Australia decided to do geoengineering. So they will try to get compensation from Australia. Can we use our model results for this? Show they're the same. We use two models, the HEDGEM and the Max Planck uh, Earth system model, and they show different results. So it's even there, it's a question of what would be necessary. Could we trust our models? And is there, in principle, at the time we may do CE, uh, liability system available to solve these questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Ulrika, for a very good talk, and especially for opening up climate modelers to future international <laughs> lawsuits. <laughs> Does anyone have uh, questions for Ulrika? So why is it when you spread the injection out over longitude that it's less efficient? Just it's a mic yes, it's aerial microphysics. So when you inject into one grid box, you have uh, the source SO2 only very close to this one grid box. And there you have high SO2, and there's a source for smaller particles. And there is that gets transported, but uh, the high amount of small particles are still close to the source. And correlation depends on the ratio between large and small particles. So the large particles you have everywhere because they really get transported. But in this case, you have only a very small area, both small particles and large particles. But when you inject all along the equator, you have large and small particles everywhere. And so we have better condition for correlations. We get larger particles. So you get larger particles when you spread it out. Yes. It was, yes, this was surprising, but yeah. It's the same when you uh, use continuous or pulse emissions. You also, with the pulse emissions, you are more efficient than you are with the continuous. We found that with Wacom as well. It was a little surprising. Yeah. <laughs> More questions? <laughs> so, uh, you know, some people suggested that we just emit sulfuric acid. Um, do you have an opinion about whether that really matters or whether injecting right behind an airplane is different than injecting over a grid cell? It, it will differ. So, um, of course, the microphysics is different. This is, I think, a really weak point at the moment in our simulation as we inject into a grid box. And in reality, you will inject uh, most probably via a plane. So you, your injection area is more of this size, and not 200 by 200 kilometers. And the, as I just mentioned, the difference in the aerosol microphysics for these two cases in the box or along the equator, something like this will happen as well. So there, studies with H2SO4, and uh, they say that it's much easier to control the size of the particles if you inject H2SO4. But I'm not completely sure if it would work. I haven't looked up this in really up in detail. And of course, H2SO4 is much heavier. It's another point that you need to transport up there a lot more than if you take SO2. So let's say you're successful in controlling temperature and, um, and you're not mucking up the precipitation too much. You're still not addressing uh, uh, ocean acidification, right? So do, you, do people talk about that much in these? Oh, it's a fact, and we, we, we name it as a fact, and it's a real drawback for all this idea of climate engineering that you don't handle the problem at the source, difference with CDR, uh, which would do this. So it's, uh, yes, of course, one really big minus 
uh, within these techniques. Yeah, you can, uh, I haven't done it, but of course you can look up all the drawbacks for the ocean, for example, you will still have, which is the same as under climate change, yeah. In fact, it gets worse because the solubility of CO2 increases as it the temperature goes temperature. down. So. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing we found um, in Wacom with volcanic simulations is it's important to have interactive chemistry w with OH um, being depleted after some volcanic eruptions. And a, a lot of uh, climate models that are doing geoengineering simulations don't have all that full interactive chemistry. Do you have any sense of how important that is for, for geoengineering? As we also have no interactive chemistry, I have no experience with that as I haven't, couldn't use it. Uh, but of course also another example is ozone, which I uh, did with another model that you really have when you inject SO2, you have the reaction of the sulfur with the ozone and you get the ozone depletion as mentioned. And with the OH, I have personally no experience. The, you are the expert. But in general, it would be good to have the chemistry to really simulate all impacts and uh, to see if also. So what we played around here is that I, I took the ozone, um, the change ozone field of the Wacom model and, and implemented it into our models. So just I took the changes and I saw an impact on the QBO. It was, I don't remember at the moment, it was not strong. And only if you inject small amounts, you inject higher amount then the warming is overwhelming everything. But there is an impact and we, yeah, we don't have it, so unfortunately. Any more questions? Uh, two questions. First of all, um, can you remind us why they chose two degrees C as a benchmark? No, <laughs> I think it was a. <laughs> it was a bit... I'm not sure. I've not found anybody who really could give you this answer. <laughs> but uh, I think it's maybe a point where you still have some people still have the feeling we can handle the climate under two degrees. Okay, so it's a realistic, but. Uh, yeah. A challenge, <laughs> challenge, challenging, but realistic. Yes. Um, so the other question is, um, and, and Simone brought this up a couple of weeks ago in a research report um, in terms of the total amount of sulfur per year, or whatever. And where where would that come from? I'm not a chemist, for the <laughs> <laughs> of course. I mean, we have. It's a huge amount. It's a huge amount. We have some. Available as I, I compared here, uh, I said it's 84% uh, of the emission we have uh, in the, the tropospheric emission. So we capture some SO2 from the stacks. We do this, and I guess it might be available. I, I'm not sure if this would work, or so even as I'm not sure how you really would bring up all this. It's really highly theoretical what we do. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Just maybe one note, um, people probably maybe know, but I mean, the main call is now to really reach 1.5 degrees, and that's mostly discussed, even that's even more unlikely to reach, but that's really the, when you look at these islands uh, that be impacted by sea level rise, uh, they really push for that target uh, so they can stay on these islands. And that's one of the measures that, that resulted in some certain degrees. But of course, there are all these impact measures that you can look at. And there's this IPCC assessment report that will can give you more ideas why you would choose a 1.5 or 2 degree target. So really, what would be needed to keep our current climate and people on the islands would be 1.5, I think. So Ulrika, how about uh, in the uncertainties about the cumulus parameterization and aerosol dependence in those, how about if we go to a new era with more use of super parameterizations with better aerosols, could that, how much 
could that change these results substantially? I don't know. Is there, yeah, the ideas of using sort of metals. Well, I don't know the, the the sophistication that we have right now in aerosol dependence in cumulus parameterizations on which all of the climate models, I assume, are are depending pretty heavily right now. And I know people work in that area, but I, I don't know about the uncertainty because it seems like that your results would be really dependent. On uh, in cumulus parameterizations here, and then going to super parameterizations where we have more explicit microphysics being used there more uh, globally, including in the tropics. And so, but even that's a relatively fresh area, c controversial from what I understand. So I'm just wondering, I guess the overall aerosol dependency on cumulus uh, uh, that's implicit in, a, in any of the climate models right now, including the ECHO model, what uncertainty is there in your results from that? Correct. Mm -hmm. So you mean the sulfate impact on the cumulus, or? I, yeah, that's right, sure. Um, so I try to estimate this one. So there are a few studies out, at least if you, if you do reasonable CE, this seems to be not a very strong impact. Even, of course, you have a slight increase of the aerosol amount of the sedimentation, but uh, this impact seems to be, yeah, really not the re, re, uh, re net, net legible. So it's <laughs> not really that strong. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, you said the delivery system was these, all these aircraft flying up and delivering thousands of of uh, tons of uh, sulfate, but each of those aircraft is putting out lots of CO2. Anybody calculate how much CO2 is related to the delivery system? I think they did. I'm not really aware of their number. Good. And the amount of energy you will need to lift that much SO2 to the stratosphere would be on the order of a tenth of a percent of the global energy consumption. That's a lot, but it, so one tenth of one percent, mm -hmm. give or take a factor of ten. If I remember right, that paper that you cited had uh, about ten percent uh, of CO2 of the current usage yeah, of CO2. If you would do the two watt cooling, which was way less than we have estimated, actually. But I mean, our current air traffic is about 5 to 10 percent of the total emission, so that also gives some our number. Can I make one last comment? Yeah, okay. So I was wondering, are, uh, so it's not totally related to the talk, but I was wondering if besides uh, understanding what geoengineering would do, are there any modeling studies so accurate about uh, other alternative ways of um, comp compensating climate change, like specific ways that we could re um, reduce the emissions, like um, if we invest all this money instead of, you know, in geoengineering, if we invest it in solar energy in the US, I don't know. Um, are there studies so accurate as these to see the effect? I'm quite sure that they are. Okay. So I have not done it. For, there are also other studies with other climate engineering techniques and so on. Yeah, there's, it's a very wide field. Will be, I don't, so I can't get, tell you right away, look at this. <laughs> but right. there must be something. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. As what, however, is all hidden behind, uh, even in the, such a OCP, yes. <laughs> Any more questions? All right, let's thank Ulrika once again.